एच एफ मार्शल ए पी सिंह फॉर्मर चीफ्स एस्टीम चेयर गैलेंट वेटरन्स डिस्टिंग ऑडियंस एंड ऑनलाइन व्यूवर्स अ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू यू ऑल एंड आई एम इंडीड थैंकफुल फॉर दिस ऑपरचुनिटी टू शेयर माई थाट्स ऑन द टॉपिक ऑफ एक्सप्लॉयटेशन ऑफ ड्रोन्स मैन एंड मैन टीम्स इन फ्यूचर कॉन्फ्लिक्स लाइक डिस्कस बाई चेयर दैट दिस इज अ रिकरेंट टॉपिक विच इज देयर पार्ट ऑफ ऑलमोस्ट एवरी ऑल्टरनेट सेमिनार विच इज हैपनिंग दीज डेज and i intend to offer a theoretical perspective to this approach the views are my own and don't reflect any institutional standpoint it may not be very clear the us the marine corps gazette is us marine corps professional journal which is in publication since the year 1916 and has been widely popular amongst the cadre an article which was not so popular at that time written by four serving officers along with a marine corps historian spoke of blurring lines in future conflict there are going to be no borders only those who are going to be targeted who are not going to be targeted and they even defined stealth as not something evading radars stealth is maybe a bomb which is fitted in the back of a car which can be driven to a city undetected by the entire intelligence apparatus that also gives the stealth what is more interesting comes now when we see what is written in the first para i'll pause a while it is almost unbelievable to know how realistic this focus was and it will be extremely surprising to know that it came out in 1989 so where do drones fit in future conflicts let's start with what is required to win any conflict to go back to colonel joint boy of usaf its people ideas and hardware and in that order i intend to approach this topic from a reverse boy that is hardware ideas and finally people it is actually confusing to know why on a topic of unmanned i seem to use this framework which actually puts people in the first but by the end of this presentation i'll probably assume that the answer will get the answer will be available let's go back to basics billy michel in 1926 defined air power as the ability to do something in or through the air and as the air covers the whole world aircraft are able to go anywhere on the planet so this is derived basically from the three characteristics of the air domain which offers to the operators that is it doesn't have obstruction so you can go at any speed it is a three dimensional thing it gives you elevation or height or at the extreme in the space you have you can see and the last is reach like the contested that air is three uh, the water is three force of the globe the other one for this earth whereas air covers everything and therefore you can reach anywhere on the globe but can aircraft really go everywhere to answer this i have three pictures below first dense forest yes they couldn't operate in the past congested cities till the availability of the modern vehicles which chair spoke of in the beginning and also the internal arrangements of say your buildings or even underground establishments air power could not permeate what did this result in wherever the air power could not reach it created a sanctuary this sanctuary was exploited by some for their own survival Evans Marshall Tony Mason in his assessment of air power in Sentinel ticket gives us this graph where at one spectrum you have the gulf war and the other spectrum you have the conflict so in most of these conflicts we will find wherever the air power has been suboptimally employed or influence the war outcomes have been mountainous wooden urban and the limited basis where from which the air power could actually reach the battlefield if i don't have a fields i could not manifest myself and the technology did not offer asymmetry to a certain extent all this was exploited by the guerrilla to hide and take sanction so what has changed the first step of our framework hardware with the availability of drones on the battlefield anything can fly and anywhere it can fly so the limitation of bases and the area where it can operate has been totally off the table top left you look it is also a drone just a box fitted with four motors a control unit 
bottom, you will find it almost looks like the crates what we use for packing and moving our stuff during posting. Fit4 Motors, it is a drone by a conventional name called Frankenstein. It's a Russian drone. What is on the right is far more interesting. What it has in its bottom is a fiber optic spool capable of flying in any contested EEW denied environment because of the wire guided nature of this drone. A little more on that a little later. So what has this basically given us? Drones have permeated previously inaccessible airspace, therefore expanding the region where air power can operate and bring up a difference in the conflict. The next topic, we explore the ideas. A lot of ideas have been existent even before there were the tools available to execute in the aerial domain, starting from the original theorist, Duhe Mitchell, and to the latest, John Warden. But all of these tend to address a conventional campaign or a point of concentration, or what we call as a center of gravity. But in case of a dispersed camouflage, divers, or hiding target, do we have a theory in place? Is there any alternate? I offer one, and we'll be happy to take on feedback for further refinement. Named it as a guava theory, nothing to resemble the fruit on the picture, just guerrilla air warfare. What is this? It is employing guerrilla warfare principles. The key word here is total in air warfare. The word total needs emphasis because uh, the, only, the popular opinion of guerrilla warfare is mobile, dispersed, agile, and it has got a lot of surprise. Whereas, in totality, it's much more. I adopt Moss framework for this, wherein beyond mobility, agility, and dispersion, which can be given by a wide array of, array of operating surfaces, the drones now bring to the battlefield the ability to derive support from the masses. Today, there is a containerized version of a drone factory which can be carried under slung in a helicopter, deployed anywhere on the battlefield, which can churn off drones as much of the inputs you put. That is your survival from the masses. People can contribute. Somebody can give the software, somebody can give or pull in his motors, somebody can give us networks. What is the third aspect? Sustenance. Sustenance or the logistics aspect. I don't need a long supply chain for operating or presenting my drones on the battlefield. All I need is a power supply. Maybe I network onto the local mobile networks by using a 4G uh, modem which is strapped on. All these examples are there. So I don't need a separate network. I don't need support from anyone. The common citizens or the common people can support it. And the last successful propaganda, the first person view drones. There is immense videos to show what kind of propaganda effect it can have despite a questionable impact of its destructive capability. So how does this work? A survivability of fundamental which can be ensured through dispersion and mobility wherein a large signature can be avoided. The previous speaker sh showed images of how large signatures on the battlefield is now a uh, inviting trouble, the kind of small signatures, the kind of drones permeate. I mean, drones can be manufactured in underground in any car garage. It can be put together in a normal tent, even inside trenches, and thereafter launched and operated precisely. It would be, prof I mean, I have to call it, the short wars are dead. The theory or the era of short wars. It's going to be long, protracted. So if needs to be protracted conflict, how do you sustain it? You need the resources which are low, which can be generated, regenerated, that is, which can be repaired at the local level and brought back to conflict in the shortest possible time. The drones are here as an answer. There are cases, to quote an example, in the 1982 Falkland War, when Argentina was running out of missiles, to, the exhausted missiles, the French denied to honor their commitment to deliver it on the battlefield due to diplomatic pressure from Britain. A similar case may be called off of threatening to the use of Starlink, denying the access of Starlink to the Ukraine in the recent past, though Starlink being a privately owned entity. So these kind of things can be obviated if we employ or look at guerrilla air warfare. 
A military industrial complex cannot be a case in this case, as explained earlier, when it gets generated on its own. While drones are now being explored or in the developmental stage, they are also possible to be expanded to a wider range to have them take over the roles of air defense. There are intercepted drones. There are EW platforms. There are ground-based casualty evacuation, a normal ground vehicle capable of carrying 300 kgs of load. And in the times of dwindling population, saving every injured and putting him back to the, co the combat may be a decisive, especially in protracted conflicts in a countries which have depleting population. You can also do a mix and match, maybe an unmanned ground vehicle fitted with a mobile SAM, operated independently, mobility, survivability, and it can throw surprise on all the platform which are flying above. Or there can be a platform which is flying over the, or rather it's floating over the sea as it comes to courts, it starts flying, carries whatever arsenal or rather it may have whatever payload it has got and delivers in the coastal areas creating havoc. A maritime plus drone threat which needs multiple or more than one domain capability. Plus they also are available for conventional employment augmenting whatever has been already existing. An interesting case study is a sleeper cell drone wherein you send a drone across during a normally not a heightened state where the defenses are low. The drone can go park itself in a tree or somewhere and just be on a receptive mode in a very low energy or passive. And at times of requirement, you can just trigger it. It goes and causes havoc or death. Ismail Hanayi's assassination is suspected to be of a similar kind of employment. So where does this all lead to? In this book, it talks of, or rather there is also a popular opinion that the post-atomic era, there is going to be an increased amount of guerrilla conflict or insurgence or terrorism. And when we see how air power has performed in all this thing, this is stating, okay, the more you don't have an offensive role, probably the better role in these kind of conflicts is a support role in terms of recce transport and so on and so forth. Now, we have an option to change this. By drones with a rigorous application of guerrilla warfare strategies or what I call the Gava theory, we can turn the tides in these kind of diffuse, blurred battlefield and execute or exploit the, the scope of employment of air power. While this is all addressed, one spectrum of warfare, which is the dull diffuse, what about the other spectrum, which is the peer-to-peer -peer conflict, which originates out of, or rather, which is strongly supported by well-funded military industrial complexes? So we can go back to this reference where they speak of six generation warfare, which is largely influenced by the uh, authors of the, uh, they were not the authors, they were the speakers who were influenced by the impact of the 1991 Gulf War. And they said, that, and we also see in the peer conflict, like it has been spoken about hypersonic weapons, long range stand of munitions. A picture on the right of the Vietnam War is probably something which is haunting a generation, a small, uh, Vietnamese soldier pointing a weapon against a downed US air crew. Probably this is, to my mind, one of the driving factors for the emphasis on development of the manned and unmanned teams. Though the manned and unmanned team is not essentially a platform or a physical entity. A lot of you must have driven here in the morning and taken the assistance of Google, which understands that you missed a turn at a particular junction and gives you a rerouting. This is a fundamental or a human machine teaming at a basic level it can be expanded to multiple regions and in various domains. It's a subset of collaborative robotics, man and humans working with each other. And originally they were developed for generating the desired degree of control of air. In peer-to-peer -peer conflict, the airspace is likely to be extremely contested. And for contested airspace, you need to develop the degree of control of air. And for that, you need three components. There were questions in the air superiority earlier. In today's scenario, you need to have a physical superiority wherein the space does not have your enemy operating there. You need to have a cyber security or the cyber superiority which your systems are able to operate even in terms of adverse attacks on it. And finally, the spectrum superiority which brings all this together and finally transforms as a final capability. So how does it transform war fighting? Edward Lutwak used the term countermeasure holiday. 
any time a new platform or a capability manifests on the battlefield, it doesn't have a countermeasure readily available. So its outputs or rather its effects are overblown. But over a period of time, the countermeasure holiday ends when the countermeasures are developed. So in the case of the drones, at the beginning of conflict, these were few months. And as a recent example suggests, the countermeasure holiday is as close as six weeks or even lower if we read other estimates. Therefore, the initial asymmetry continues to drop. The second aspect when we are employing drones is to understand that something which is widely open, widely accessible, can be made available to everyone, is equally accessible to your enemy. So there is no asymmetry over a period of time in terms of numbers and in terms of what our capability can bring to the battlefield. This is not only true of the homemade drone, this is also true of the manned and unmanned teams. Let me explain why. Going back to Paul Char, one of the leading experts on autonomous weapons in his book, The Army of None, in simulated situations, he finds that when the aircraft or algorithms are met to fight each other, the physical aircraft, over a period of time, it assumes that, or rather it ends up in a stalemate. People who have experience or in the uh, hobby of, or in the habit of using ChatGPT, DeepSeek, and the other LLM models coming out, you push in a query in all three, the result is likely to be same. So maybe intelligence or artificial intelligence is overrated because the fundamental training and the procedure or the logic which drives these are similar. So when you are expecting man dumbdown teaming to penetrate or operate a near or a contest a near peer or a peer adversary, it should be borne in mind he would also have similar capabilities, trained on similarities, and therefore there is a very high chance that it would end up in a stalemate. So what do we need to do? One concept I'd like to put across is a concept of personal air defense. Go back to the drone which I spoke of in the morning, wherein there is a big spool of fiber optics lying on its belly, which is completely immune to electronic warfare, and it can be flown and guided onto a target from a distance of 20 kilometers as on date. Say I am a VIP, I am going to address an election rally at some particular area. A usual security cordon is maybe the longest range of the small arms or the snipers which are there, which may be two to four kilometers depending on the threat scenario. Today, the capability is available to launch or prepare a drone of this capability, sitting 10 to 15 kilometers away, launch it, reach anyone, completely un uninteracted or un undetected, and thereafter cause havoc, provided we have not kept the necessary checks and measures in place. So there is a need to rethink doctrine tactics and thereafter training, and there is a need to rethink about the logistics, because now there is going to be a need for enhanced amount of electricity and processing power right at the battle space. Do we have plans to provide it to the users there? If you need to manufacture it at the battle or closer to the battle area, what is the support that is likely to be? These are likely to have a rethink on the kind, nature, and type of logistics that are going to support the future battlefield. The earlier battles were close to the railroads, the future is unlikely to be. Coming to the last part of my talk, Finally, the people. High-tech demands high-quality people. And there is an illusion of capability which I need to put forth here. I may have a smartphone. I may be capable of using WhatsApp or Instagram or taking a few pictures. It also gives me an illusion of capability that I am an avid smartphone user, whereas the same smartphone can be used by an intelligent operator on the battlefield to fly a FPV into an enemy target or a hacker to hack a network while sitting in this room. So I can't, or rather I should not mistake my ease of use the platform offers as my capability. That is what is the illusion of capability that I need to speak of. And where what needs, or rather is needs to be refined is that technique, tactics, which are relevant to the platform in terms of a capability to operate in EW denied environment, bad weather, strong wind conditions, how do I operate in closed or confined spaces, what are the new sort of emergencies these kind of platforms are likely to throw up how am I going to be better or rather outwit my enemy in terms of my capability? In the end, I would say the operator finally prevails and the drone's bounties by expanding the operation where air power had previously not permeated, expands by supplementing the role and they do not replace. And wish to conclude my talk, people, ideas, hardware in that sequence. Thank you.